Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. So uh, here we are, I welcome all of you to this course called Development Processes and Social Movements and uh, we are nearing towards the end of this uh, course. So this is your lecture number 19 and after that you will be left with just the last lecture, lecture number 20 which will be on anti-corruption movements. So uh, about the farmers movements, you have some idea when I had introduced this idea of uh, development processes and social movements, there I had told you about numerous kinds of movements and you have already read about women's movements uh, as well as say environmental movements. Uh, so all these movements tell us about the different sections of the society and what kind of discontent that they face due to which they go for a movement. So let me first tell you, let us first introduce this idea that why do we need to study farmers movement or in the present context why do we need to know about the problems that the farmers of India face. So maybe some of you must be aware that in the year 2020 and 21 and that was also the time like we, we were going through the uh, period of COVID, uh, India saw a major struggle like this was the farmers movement which took place and all over India uh, the farmers got united for their demands and they were not happy about some of the legislations which took place. So it is in the light of uh, these recent farmers movements that is one reason to understand about farmers movement. So what were the major demands? One was for the better prices that they should get better prices for their food grains. Second, they were uh, looking for subsidies in electricity as well as for seed and fertilizer. So here we should also remember the framework of developed versus developing countries because in developed countries, the farming sector has a lot many advantages which are given by the state. So the policies made by state are in favor of the farmers vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the farmers in the developing countries they have to face numerous difficulties and that's why this we can see in the framework of developed versus developing countries framework. Then there were three farm acts which had come up in September 2020 and the farmers were not happy about it. One of them was about uh, the minimum support price MSP. Then another was about their uh, electricity, the rates of electricity and third was about this that the people who were involved in uh, some of you must have heard of that the remains of agriculture if they burn it then that will be considered as a criminal case. So uh, these three things were something that people, uh, the farmers were not happy about. So this is one backdrop that I wanted to tell you that the protests which took place in the year 2020 and 21. So that gives us the contemporary or the, the present scenario where the farmers are trying to unite themselves in order to better negotiate their uh, interests. Other than this, there is another issue which is of the suicide by the farmers. And in uh, states like Maharashtra and Karnataka, we come across numerous uh, cases of farmer suicide. And what are the reasons behind these farmer suicide? One is that they are unable to pay back their loan. That is one of the biggest reasons. Then another reason is that they do not get the loan easily. So one is that if they get the loan, they are unable to pay back. Second, that the loan that they get, sometimes the rate of interest is high and uh, uh, they are unable to cope up with the commercial crops farming. So there is this uh, in a way dichotomy between uh, growing the crops which are for say the food grains and for the commercial crops. So sometimes what happens is that the farmers are unable to cope up with the demands uh, of commercial crops. 
uh, one more problem that they face is that now uh, there is this corporate far farming which is the fourth point that I have mentioned that the prospects for something like corporate farming is not so we can't say that a developing country like India can actually go for corporate farming. The reason is that we have a large number of farmers who are small farmers or uh, you can say they have the medium size the land. So corporate farming is something in which huge area of land is actually and it is the corporate itself which goes for farming. So right now for a country like India, the idea of corporate farming is in a nascent stage. We are in the beginning of that. So it has to go for a long way. Then there is this demand for agrarian reforms that there should be such laws that are in favor of the farmers. Then uh, the farmers are also uh, demanding for agro industries that there should be small scale agriculture based industries where they can uh, uh, they can have production of uh, such things that can be sold in even outside the country. Then uh, one more thing which I haven't mentioned here but that is the problem of cold storage or, or such to have substantive amount of places to store their food grains. So what happens is that many of the farmers they lose their harvest and they have to because they are unable to uh, keep their harvest for a longer period of time that they are forced to sell it at a very uh, low price. So that is also another thing that the storage capacity needs to be increased. For a country like India, a developing country like India, these are the numerous problems that we face. So what will be the cost of electricity to uh, how will we cope up with the demands for water to uh, storing the, the food grains. So here the last point that I have mentioned is that agriculture sector vis-a-vis -vis service sector. So what is this point? So uh, you must be knowing that uh, a huge amount of our GDP is actually contributed by the IT sector, information technology sector. So what happens is that, that the production uh, from the agriculture sector uh, that has a substantively less amount it uh, contributes to our GDP. Uh, but at the same time, a large number of people means the section of population which is dependent on, agri on agriculture is much more. So this is you can say a skewed kind of uh, a proportion that higher the number of people who are dependent on agriculture sector but lower their uh, ratio that they contribute to the GDP. And similarly from the service sector lesser the number of people who are there in the services but their uh, contribution to the GDP is high. So this is also something that we need to keep in mind that agriculture sector in India is not doing that well. So um, we will eventually learn what all are the problems that the farmers in India face. So by this uh, first slide I have given you a broad overview of what are the problems that the uh, farmers in India face and why do we need to study about farmers movement. Now I thought of giving you a backdrop of pre-independence days. Let me tell you why pre-independence days because the farmers uh, here I would like to tell you two reasons. One that the farmers uh, movements also played an important role in the making of Indian national movement. So that is one link that you should remember that the farmers were also the ones who were part of the national movement especially after Gandhi became the mass leader. And secondly, uh, the problems that were faced by the farmers at that point of time, some of them have a continuity even today. So let me tell you about some of the major farmers movements in pre-independence days. But let me also tell you that other than these 6, 7 that I have mentioned here, there are many other uh, farmers movements also about which we haven't mentioned and about them you may read on your own. So it was in 1920s and 30s that the farmers were fighting for less taxation. So they were saying and this was the time when the British rule was there. So you should understand as India was 
India was at that time not an independent country. So the Britishers actually laid down such rules that they were disadvantageous for different communities, be it the farmers or the workers. So different sections of the society were facing difficulties. So what were the difficulties faced by the farmers? Uh, that the taxation was high. So suppose if there is a flood, then also they have to pay the tax or if there is a famine then also they have to uh, pay the tax so irrespective of the amount of produce that they had they were compelled to or they were forced to uh, go for taxation so this was one so relief in case of flood and rot so the farmers were demanding for this that in case there is a flood or in case there is drought then there should be no taxation they also like they were also protesting against the forced labor or a kind of physical torture because during the colonial days uh, the farmers faced numerous difficulties so they were seeking for a kind of relief from all these one of the first movements was avadh andolan in up so there is this region a, a region in up which is called avadh so in the avadh region this uh, uh, andolan was called the avadh andolan by the farmers then another was the kheda satyagraha in gujarat which was in 1918 then there was mopila rebellion in malabar malabar is a region in kerala and that is something which is for a longer duration of time from 1850s to 1920s and during this period of say 70 years at numerous points so there were numerous uprisings in different parts of kerala thus i have mentioned it the malabar region and mopila rebellion was uh, which took place in different parts of kerala uh, in the malabar region at different points of time then this champaran satyagraha in bihar which maybe many of you must have heard of because that was uh, the first experiment of satyagraha which was done by Gandhi at that point. So uh, what happened in case of Champaran Satyagraha was that uh, there the farmers were forced to cultivate indigo, uh, which we also call the Neel Ki Kheti. Uh, so by Neel Ki Kheti, we uh, l tend to know it more frequently than the indigo cultivation. So uh, the, uh, the cultivation of indigo was not a very happy kind of situation for the farmers because it needed a lot of uh, uh, it, it it led to plight of the farmers so it was gandhi who led this movement in champaran and this champaran satyagraha was one of the first satyagraha and later on uh, kheda satyagraha in ahmedabad was also led by gandhi mm, then uh, there were three movements in west bengal one is wahhabi movement then Farazi movement and Tebagha movement. So these movements uh, took place in different years in the towards the end of 19th century. So at different places in West Bengal, these farmers movements were taking place. Then there was Telangana movement in Andhra during uh, 1941 to 51. And Telangana, as you know that now Telangana is a separate state. But at that point of time, since this farmers movement took place, that movement in that region itself was called Telangana movement. So here by this slide, now you know uh, that in different parts of India, farmers movement was taking place um, uh, during the independence movement. So here we have read about the pre-independence phase. Now we move on to post-independence India. Now we, if look at uh, post-independence, then here I have taken uh, help of Sudha Pai's classification who classifies the agrarian movements into five, five categories. She says that we come across different kinds of issues in agrarian movements. Some are about the pattern of land ownership. So some movements are about if there is a struggle like if there are two different groups regarding the land if there is a kind of so what will be the mode of ownership. So usually between the Jamindars and those who are landless. Uh, so Rayat and Jamindari system you must have heard of. So all those were about the mode of ownership. Then this also suggests us the class structure that uh, those who 
have the land and those who do not have the land so there is a difference between the two so it is also about the agrarian relations that what kind of relation do these two groups face then the second kind of movements are about state policies so some of the movements are actually about not being happy about the state policies so what happens is that they look for the change in policies that will lead to change in the agrarian economy so first typology was about land ownership second is about the state policies third is about the technology based change so sometimes the farmers look forward to a change in technology for example here i can tell you about the green revolution that uh, in case of green revolution uh, in punjab which where we gradually move to use of uh, technology Uh, then also high yielding varieties of uh, seeds so th that is a kind of technology based change then there is this the pattern of mobilization and then some of the movements can also be about mobilizing the farmers for uh, for these issues then fifth is the issue about leadership in leadership we learn about the strategies issues and demands so these are the five kinds of things that we need to take care of uh, that we need to uh, take into consideration when we study the agrarian movements in india now i have just uh, titled this as agrarian movements so uh, other than say farmers movement when we study about the relationship the agrarian relationship be it about the land or uh, for example uh, the policies made by the state regarding the agriculture sector all these together we call as agrarian sector so what is what kinds of agrarian movements are there so this was one type of classification the previous one sudha pai talks about these five ways of classification what we are now talking about is another way of uh, classifying the agrarian movement for example one can be anti feudal movement so what is anti feudal when the small scale farmers they were asking for the zamindari system to be abolished zamindari system abolition of in a feudal system basically if we talk about feudal system then one section of the society has control on especially the land is having the ownership by the landlord we call them the landlord so there are two groups landless sorry landlords those who are rich and have the control over the land and then there are landless those who have no land so in feudal system the society is especially the agrarian society is uh, is divided into these two groups so eventually what happens is that the landless those who do not have land they demand for land so what will be the ways to get the land for them so there can be land grab means those who have a lot of land the state may just take away their excessive land as it happened in case of 1950s when the abolition of zamindari system took place then the state decided that it will just grab the land and then it will distribute that land among the landless then similarly there was another case which was of bhudan and gramdan vinoba bhave was in favor of these two that we need to give the land to those who are poor so in that case also uh, the land was distributed among the landless so these are the anti feudal movements which is against the exploitation by the landlords second is the movements by the rich peasants or capitalist farmers now see the previous one was by the landless ones so they were seeking for land for themselves now the second type is by the rich farmers so what do the rich farmers want they want to have the commercialization of agriculture since they are rich uh, farmers they look forward that the state should actually help them in commercializing the agriculture 
So what happens is that now there is a class differentiation and that leads to the urban versus rural interest. So the farmers say that the state tends to favor the industrial sector more and they argue that even the agrarian sector should be given its due importance by the state. So it is the capitalist farmers who unite themselves and then they try to pursue it with the state. Now the third kind of movements which I have named as post liberalization that is since 1990s we come across globalization in Indian economy. So what has happened is that there is this market oriented agricultural policies which has led to discontent among Indian farmers. So now you know that uh, there are numerous instances when the farmers who are not happy about uh, say something like a corporate farming or uh, the way multinational companies tend to appropriate the farms. For example, let me give you an example of companies like Lay's. You must have come across that in a packet of 10 rupees Lay's, you hardly have 10 to 12 Lay's. And just imagine how many potatoes were needed for that. Maybe just one potato or two potatoes. And with that they make those 10 to 12 or ma maybe maximum 15 chips. And that is, so on the one hand, what, uh, what kind of uh, harm uh, that will do to the farmers? They will be selling the, uh, the potatoes to the, the company lays at a very low price. But the amount of money that the Lay's is earning as a company is huge. So uh, it is beyond our imagination the, the amount of profit that they have by selling Lay's. So mostly in the packet of Lay's it is the air which is filled and hardly any substance not even one full potato if it will be a big potato. So that is the example that I wanted to give you that the Indian farmers often feel cheated vis-a-vis uh, -vis the role that they see um, of the corporate sector. So I have named this slide as agrarian movement. Another one that I am going to talk about peasant movements because peasant movement is this is so now, now I have told you one the overall this chapter I have called farmers movement but here I am using the term peasant. Peasant is a term which is used in a Marxist framework. So the Marxians, the Marxists use the term peasant for the, for the farmers who usually have very small amount of land or, or say no land but they just uh, work for the landlords. So here uh, what happens is that in order to study the peasant movements, three approaches were taken up. One is that of the Marxists who look at the class character of the actors involved. So they are more interested into the class character means there will be one class which is that of the landlord and another class of the landless. So these are the two categories and as you must be knowing that in the Marxist framework we stress so much on the class division in the society. So the Marxists focus on class struggle, class struggle and class division. Here let me tell you quickly that we will study, uh, you must have learnt about this idea of class in one of the lectures uh, if I remember correctly it is either lecture number 15 uh, which is on the class politics in India. Uh, why I wanted to remind this to you is about you should not feel blank as in what is class. So class and caste, these are two important categories to understand the different ways of social stratification, how the society is uh, understood in India. So A.R. Desai has done some studies and also uh, Dhangare has uh, done some of the studies on peasant uh, struggles in India. Then second way of looking at peasant movements is that of the nationalists. So here the issue of nationalist kind of means the entire country was undergoing this national movement the Indian national movement was going on. So when we talk about the nationalist character then we say that this problem of 
land reforms being a failure it is something which is pre prevalent in all over country. So, it is not just it is not just one or two states, but most of the states face similar difficulties and thus we come across land grab movements in West Bengal to Kerala to Karnataka, UP etc. So, it was in the 1960s and 70s that numerous such movements the land grab movements took place in which the state grabbed the lands from uh, those who had uh, the undue uh, amount of land or they had a lot of land that was grabbed by the state in order to distribute among the landless ones. Third approach is that of the subaltern approach. Subaltern approach is about writing the history from the below. So, this approach says that even the national movement in India is something that we need to understand or to study from the peasants points of view. So, we should not just look at what uh, role has been played by the congress, but we should also study about the role played by the by the farmers or say by the tribals. So, in that sense subaltern perspective is also very very important to study the peasants movement. So, one was Marxist, second was nationalist and third was subaltern. Now, here let me tell you that this is the approaches that I have mentioned it is based on ideological leanings. So, while the previous one was about say the character because the feudal ones or the capitalist farmers. So, this was based on interest groups different kinds of interests. So, based on interest this classification was further previous one was about the different patterns be it land ownership or state policies or technology mobilization and leadership. So, these are the key terms that you may remember. So, why did I again come back little bit here is that you do not get confused about these different patterns of doing it because first we have come to the post independence India it is about the period, but the same thing can be actually studied in different ways. So, this is one way which is the anti feudal movement then the movements by the rich peasants then post liberalization how this nature and character had changed and this one was about the ideological leanings how do the Marxists study. So, for the Marxists it is the class framework is very important they look at the class relationship. For the nationalists they look at the all India character of the movement that the land grab kind of a thing should take place all over the country because in different states in all the states there are those who are landlords and there are those who are landless. So, here the focus is on the nationalist one and the last one the subaltern it says rewriting the history means we need to go back to the national movement by keeping the farmers in the in the center. So, we should not think that everything has been done by the elite because even the farmers played an important role. So, now we come to the next one which is green revolution and its consequences. Green revolution it is something I am sure that most of you must have heard of. So, it was in the 1960s and 70s in order to gain in a way self sufficiency regarding the availability of food that the food grain should be sufficient. Otherwise what was happening was that we had to get the food from uh, countries like USA. So, be it wheat or some other food grains that were imported from America. So, it was considered uh, uh, it was felt that India as a country should be self sufficient. So, for that they uh, were getting into this new agricultural policy which was in a way kind of shift from an institutional to technological. So, while land reform was the example of institutional because how to have a certain proportion of land that everyone should all the farmers should have land. Now, the focus was on technological that we need to have 
the biochemical and mechanical innovations in order to increase our productivity. So, from land relations now the focus shifted to increasing the yield means the food crop production should go higher. So, this was one shift so in the agricultural policy. The second point regarding this is that so how will we have this technological change? So, there were uh, high yielding varieties we in the short form we call it HYVs high yielding varieties of food grains uh, were to be used in of the seeds. Then uh, fertilizers were to be used pesticides more water and electricity these were the requirements of green revolution that we had to gradually shift to such kind of uh, system that more fertilizers more pesticides these were the things which were used. Then the third point is that it marked an end to the equity concern of land distribution and it now focused on growing demand for food grains. So, no more land distribution was that much of a concern but rather it was understood that see there is an inequality and we are accepting that but we need to move on and our more important objective is that how to have more production. So, this is like moving on from one thing to another. So, you understand that there is uh, a kind of uh, inequality there is social inequality, but at the same time more important is the problem that we need to increase our production. So, that was the thing. Now, what happened is that this is something which is very interesting that Rudolf and Rudolf they use a term a concept which is bullock capitalist. What is bullock capitalist? Rudolf and Rudolf said that in India we get to see a mixed characteristic. We have what kind of mixture is there? So, there is a capitalist system, there is a pre industrial system and also a non capitalist feature. So, there are rich farmers the prosperous farmers are there and so they use bullocks for their farming. But at the same time since now they will have a surplus of money. So, they will play a role even in the capitalism or say the capitalist economy they will be contributing. So, that is the term that they use for the rich farmers they are the bullock capitalists. Uh, maybe this is a term that you should remember or, or you can uh, take a note of that who use the term bullock capitalist then it will be Rudolf and Rudolf. Then here comes the point that we need to compare the pros and cons of green revolution. So, on the one hand if we became self sufficient in terms of our food grains, but at the same time it also had adverse ecological impacts because the amount of ground water that was being used there is a, an immense fall in the level of ground water in Punjab. And similarly, the fertility and quality of soil has gone down due to excessive use of insecticides and pesticides. So, uh, I forgot to mention that green revolution is something that took place primarily in Punjab and uh, in the present times Punjab is also the state which faces the highest number of cancer and there is a train uh, which is called the cancer train which runs from, uh, from Punjab to Rajasthan. So, there is one hospital where uh, the, these people are treated. So, while green revolution had its uh, positive impact on the society, but at the same time it also had the negative impact. So, this is something that I wanted to tell you that uh, there were ecological degradation in Punjab. Now, we move on to the next which I have mentioned as. So, now all these developments we are talking about is in the post independence India and we are learning about different aspects of farmers movements and, and the problems faced by the farmers. Now, there were numerous movements by the rich farmers in India, especially in Punjab, UP and Haryana and there were formations of numerous organizations. For example, uh, one of the most famous one is the Bharatiya Kisan Union BKU of which the leader Chaudhary Charan Singh he became a leader of say nationalist uh, 
like his importance was of that of a national leader and other than up what happened is that bku also had its spread in punjab and haryana so bhartiya kisan union and as you can see bku as a union so it it acted as a pressure group so it tried to negotiate with the state in the in favor of rich farmers so now from here there is this uh, shift and there is a divide between the interests of the rich farmers and the poor farmers so of course when it will come to movement then it is the rich farmers whose voice can easily reach to the government then there was this karnataka raj rayat sang krrs this is another organization of karnataka then uh, in maharashtra there was shetkari sangathan ss shetkari sangathan uh, the shetkari sangathan was again of the rich farmers and uh, they were the ones who were looking forward to the production of commercial crops so as there is a divide among the farmers for example the rich farmer and the poor farmer similarly in terms of crops there is uh the, there are crops which are the food grains and there are crops which are commercial crops for example sugarcane is one commercial crop or say production of rubber etc uh or even groundnut so their demands were as following and these rich farmers were demanding for following thing one was uh, the higher prices for agricultural produce so of course you can easily understand that they were looking for better prices then lower prices for technological inputs so here higher price for what they produce and lower price for their uh, what they have to invest for seeds fertilizer electricity etc and third they accused the state for urban bias and they said there is this debate india versus bharat so bharat is uh, the one where the farmers are so the rich versus poor part of the country they also accused the state that the state gives more importance to the industrial sector so what happened is that this uh, these movements actually saw the caste class combination so caste and class came together in in the name of being farmers so in terms of interests of the farmers irrespective of their caste and class they started coming together so ideological divide is also another thing that we need to uh, keep in mind now what was the impact of globalization on farmers if we talk about major implications on agriculture then it is say first is freeing of control because maybe you must have heard of lpg lpg is liberalization privatization and third is globalization as you can see the first letter of these three together they become lpg now what has happened is that that these three have affected almost all the sectors be it agriculture health education etc so there is there are two sectors private sector and public sector private public now most of the schools at the time of independence our uh, education was something which was run by the government or even in health sector most of the hospitals were run by the uh, by the government but now what we see is that uh, private sector has a huge you can say uh, intrusion and the number of uh, educational institutions be it the schools or the universities uh, these uh, private sector now has a kind of strong presence in india and this specially happened india adopted lpg in 
the year 1990. So, adoption of liberalization, privatization and globalization, how did it affect the farming sector? That is what I am going to discuss here. So, what were the major implication? One that the freeing of control means there was no more a control upon the market. So, the farmers were in that sense were free to sell their agriculture produce to even outside the country. Second was removal of subsidies and price support. So, uh, 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 rather than as it was in the pre-LPG means before uh, the private sector was open in India, now the subsidies and price support were in a way removed. Third was that there was this dependence on market force. So, as earlier the farmers looked at the government for their support, now no more they had the government support. So, that led to opening of the economy, Indian economy was now opened, Indian economy became part of the global economy. So, market wise there was a kind of integration with the world economy. Then the last point is that now there was this free export and import of agricultural commodities. So, what will happen is that if other countries give us things at a lower price, then the Indian farmers have to compete with that kind of a price. So, as you get to see in other sectors like say electricity goods in the electric goods, uh, the Chinese products are much cheaper vis-a-vis -vis Indian products. So, what happens is that China as a country uh, has more benefit vis-a-vis uh, -vis that of those the Indian manufacturers. So, is the case with the agricultural produce as well. So, what happened is that there was this uh, national agriculture policy which was brought by the NDA government and it tried to convert agriculture into an industry and that was something which was not a welcome move by the farming community, they were not very happy about it. So, we see that there is a slowing down in the rate of agricultural growth and the rate of agricultural growth has not remained the same and there is a widening disparity between the agricultural and the non-agricultural sector. So, of course, the agricultural sector is unable to do that well as much we expected it to. So, globalization, we can say that globalization has adversely affected the farming sector. Means, uh, if the IT sector has uh, done fairly well because it is in uh, there is a positive impact on the IT sector, we do not see that kind of a positive impact on the agricultural sector. And here the next point I am I am mentioning is farmer suicide because how do we look at farmer suicides? Are these just uh, an instance, just a phenomenon or we need to look at the wider you can say or more concrete reasons for that. So, here I have taken help of uh, Sudha Pai's argument who says that we should not look at them as just a localized thing, but rather as a sociological phenomenon. Means it is problem, it is, it is part of a larger societal problem that under uh, which the society is undergoing. So, basically Sudha Pai uh, argues that this crisis is actually rooted in the economic reforms. So, just now what we discussed in the previous slide regarding the impact of globalization that is linked with the increasing number of farmer suicide. One that they are unable to cope up with the corporate farming kind of a thing. They are unable to cope up with the farming, the, uh, the commercial farming. Then third, they are unable to uh, get the loan at a price which is which has lesser degree of uh, interest rate. So, these are some of the problems. So, there is a failure of delivery systems to the small farmers. So, while the rich farmers have been able to unite themselves in the name of different organizations, that is not the case with the small farmers. Small farmers are more vulnerable they are unable to cope up with this change which has come up due to globalization. So, what has happened is that there is this two way pressure. One, there is this external market pressure that 
whatever they produce, how will they find the right market for that? And second, there is this internal support structure failing. Here, in terms of internal support structure failing, one is the availability of things like seeds, fertilizers, insecticides, etc. So, they have to pay a heavy price for that and they are unable to uh, have enough money for buying all these. And secondly, when they produce uh, their farm, when the farm product is there, then due to lack of the storage facility, they are unable to keep their uh, agricultural produce for a longer time. So, these are the problems which they face regarding the internal support structure. So, uh, the point that here I want to make is that there is an increasing class fragmentation within the farming community. So, we, know, we cannot say that the farming community is one uh, unified whole because there are rich farmers, there are poor farmers, then there are intermediate farmers who are the in between ones. Then similarly, there is a caste divide. So, there will be the Brahmin farmers, there will be Dalit farmers, then there is ideological divide. So, there this fragmentation is due to one is class, the rich, poor, etc. Then there is ideology. and there is caste also. So, you have to remember these three ways of fragmentation that the farmers are divided into different groups on the basis of class, there is a different kind of fragmentation. On the basis of ideology, there can be those who will have a Marxist orientation, those who will have a Gandhian orientation. So, ideologically also they will be divided and sometimes due to caste they will be divided. And the fourth point that I haven't mentioned is that the regional division means the farmers of uh, Maharashtra, the, far, the farmers of Punjab. So, the interests of different farmers, the different farming community because in Punjab a different kind of uh, farming culture is there or in Maharashtra. So, all of them will have their different orientation when it will come to negotiating with the state. So, what happens is that now that we know that these are the numerous problems and the government of India also understood uh, in a way took cognizance of these problems and that is why this National Commission on Farmers NCF this was constituted in the year 2004 to study whether there is a possibility of second green revolution. Can we think of something like second green revolution because while the first green revolution remained centered to only Punjab now the aim was that it should reach to other parts of the country as well and this was led by ms swaminathan that's why we also call it another name of this commission is swaminathan commission so this commission submitted four reports between 2004 to 2006 and some of the major highlights of this commission uh, the reports that it gave are as following one is the soil health enhancement that there is a need to understand that the quality of soil is going down drastically. So, we need to work upon that, that the soil uh, quality should be improved. Second is that the water harvesting and sustainable or say equitable use of water because agriculture as a sector needs a huge amount of water. So, how to minimize the use of water or how to have uh, the use of water in such a way that it does not lead to groundwater depletion. These were the things and due to that uh, water harvesting techniques were to be promoted so that we have better ways of water conservation. So, first was about soil, second is about water and third is about the credit system. So, about the credit system because as I told you one of the major reasons of farmer suicide is that 
they do not get loan at a low interest rate so to make them money easily available that they can easily take loans is something that should be there then also there should be this life insurance scheme because when the farmers if they commit suicide so sometimes what happens is that that the family has to go through a lot of difficulty because mostly the women the widows of those farmers who commit suicide they are left with they become a family without having a man and also the money and no support system is there so if there will be a life insurance scheme for the farmers it will be good for them the fourth point is about technology that there is a need to have appropriate technology we need to invest a lot into the technology so that uh, the technology is equally you can say it can be easily available for everyone and here uh, again the developed and developing countries thing comes up that the technology should be affordable means available at a lower price otherwise a large section of society will not be able to buy it only though another point is this also that the farmer should be willing to gradually move towards technology so sometimes they are not willing to use the technology so uh, the farmers also need training for that that they should be able to use the technology for example i'll give you one example is about say um, the weather forecast when is the rain likely to happen or uh, the other conditions which are conducive for the their farming or not or if there it is going to be a windy day so if they will be able to have those forecasts beforehand if they learn to use the technology then they can plan their things likewise their, their crop cycle can be uh, done in such a manner then the last point is regarding the infrastructure and organizational support for marketing so what should be the how will they access to the market once they have their agricultural product so these were the five major points on which swaminathan committee gave its report and it said that then only the farmers can so why i quickly moved to this was that we are not left with much time for this lecture so now there are uh, new actors and new kinds of movements which have come up so there there is something called seed satyagraha so they are attacking the multinational companies and kfc is a brand so similar to lays even kfc uh, also uses the agricultural products so they usually buy the products at a very low price but they sell it at a high price so uh, there are movements against them then there is also this falling price of cotton crops so a bku bharatiya kisan union has been protesting against that uh, in punjab mahendra singh tikait is the leader while chaudhry charan singh had the leadership in up then there are anti special economic zones these are the secs which uh, which are going to have the land in huge amount for industrial sector so what happens is that sometimes it is the agricultural land which is appropriated uh to to have the special economic zones so the farmers have been protesting against the special economic zones then uh, there is a new formation which is all india kisan sangharsh coordination committee aikscc this was a pan india umbrella organization of 250 small groups of farmers so it started in 2017 with 130 organizations but now the number of organizations has reached to 250 so these are some of the new actors and new movements which are taking place now uh, let's quickly talk about adverse impact of global capital although i have mentioned to you this point in previous points which was about the globalization how has globalization impacted the farmers adversely but let me quickly recap these points one is the pressure to withdraw agricultural subsidies 
that is one because th these are the likely impact which are going to be the adverse impacts on the on the farmers. So, the agricultural subsidies are being withdrawn. Then uh, another is that seed manufacturing companies. So, multinational companies are likely to manufacture the seeds. Then every year the farmers have to buy new seeds for themselves. So, which is also problematic because earlier the farmers used to keep their seed. They will conserve the seed for the next year. Now they have to buy the seed every year. Similarly, the genetically modified food, GM food are said to have bad impact on the health of the people. So, uh, how, to, uh, how to overcome the use of GM food and also sometimes it is not good for farmers because uh, a huge amount of production which it takes place that is also not something good for the farmers. So, there is this, um, there is a mismatch between how much should be produced and how much is being produced. So, how to have a correct ratio between the two that is also uh, one of the concerns. Then there is this new patent regime that the multinational companies are trying to appropriate the knowledge system. So, that is also something which is problematic because our traditional knowledge system is endangered because the farming community had its own knowledge. So, what are the recent developments? Some of the recent developments are that there is a division within the farmers movement because there are those who are beneficiaries of the globalization and there are those who are adversaries. So, there, uh, so there, there, there is this likely divide between them. Then we have organizations like KRR, RS and SS, uh, the Shetkari Sangathan who are the market oriented farmers. So, they have their different orientation which is very different from that of those who are the landless farmers. So, that is the divide which has a kind of, so there is this competitive capitalism for example, Sharad Joshi, he says that there should be a camp competitive capitalism in agriculture which will lead to removal of poverty. So, you have now uh, learnt a great deal about farmers movement in India, let me quickly conclude. Uh, so, if we look at the farmers movement, it also shows the changes which are there in Indian polity and economy. So, we come across there was this large scale horizontal mobilization among the farmers in the 1970s and 80s. But in the post 1991, there is this capitalist tendency in agriculture which came up and the there have been protests against SEZ etc which are considered to be anti-poor, anti-farmer in character. So, we, what we get to see is that it is the poor peasantry which is the worst hit due to the downturn in agriculture. And the last point that I want to tell you while concluding is that the recent farmers protests that took place in 2020 and 21 that can be seen as something how a local protest turned into a nationwide campaign. So, uh, the farming community overall, they came in a large number from all over the world to not all over the world, but all over India to come together. But this movement also got you can say the global attention because after a long time, a social movement was so successful and uh, those three laws which had come up that were repealed. So, that is the end of this lecture and here I have given some of the references which you can read. So, some of these writings are about the recent farmers movement and overall if you read this, uh, the article by Sudha Pai that will give you an idea of it will give you an overview of overall the farmers movement in India. But for pre-independence days you may read something more. Uh, so, that much should be enough I guess and I hope you enjoyed the lecture. With that, I would like to end the lecture. Thank you so much.